record heights. The question we begin with this morning, what's it like to run a bank in this environment? And now we bring in our first guest, Chris Odleifson, President and CEO of Rockland Trust. Uh, of course, first of all, thank you so much. It's great timing to have you on, uh, Chris. And, uh, My pleasure. The thing I want to start with, these positive, we just talked about the economy from the stock market to the job numbers. Is that reflected in your business right now? Uh, the Boston area is a really terrific place to be in business today. I mean, we have uh, unemployment that's below 3%. It's just absolutely extraordinary. I've never seen such a thing. So in terms of your business, where, where are you seeing the strength? Is it retail banking? Is it mortgages? Is it your, I know you're growing a portfolio management business. I mean, where are you seeing the most growth? We're seeing, we're seeing growth across the board. Uh, our commercial business is very robust. Our consumer business, we're growing at a uh, pace that is uh, unprecedented for us. And of course, our wealth management business, too, is doing quite well. So, but if you had to tease one out, I mean, not to offend the people that work in the other segments of it, but what right now in terms of like the rising star of growth in maybe the last 18 months? Yeah, so the, the largest uh, section of our balance sheet is commercial lending. And we're seeing very good growth there, and it's propelling our record earnings. Do you feel like, by the way, the commercial lending, because I'm fascinated by it, it's a little bit of a digression, but do you feel like it's getting a little toppy in that, in that, in that segment? Because it feels so hot, and there's a lot of construction going on. It just it feels a little hot. Well, I think if you sort of look at all the cranes in Boston, I think you sort of get that sense. And we're seeing maybe the high-end uh, multifamily, the big apartment buildings, luxury apartment buildings. We're, we're, we think that's getting a little frothy. Okay, but it's still st the strong underlying fundamentals for Strong that. underlying fundamentals for our, uh, the, the, uh, the Massachusetts economy, yes. So you, you, anyone who owns a bank stock knows what they've done mm -hmm. of late. Uh, and in terms of the size of bank you are, I don't know if you consider it, do you just sort of consider yourself a regional? Is that how you call it? A or regional. a super regional? No, or? no, no, definitely a regional. Okay. I'm in eastern Massachusetts. So in, in terms of a strategy, like how, how are you competing with B of A and even Santander, which has got such a large presence now in, in your area? Like what do you do to compete with them? Well, we're, we're in a sweet spot in that we're big enough to offer all the products and services you'd imagine at a bank, including a great set of digital offerings. But we're really small enough to offer a level of intimacy that sometimes the bigger banks have a hard time duplicating. And so as you expand your retail presence, that's how you sort of coach. Each, each time you open a branch, you make sure that has to be better than those, those big ones. Yes, absolutely. All right, so I want to talk about Trump. Um, you know, you sit in the big office. You, the, you make all the decisions, even though you call yourself a regional. You know, you have a pretty sizable portfolio. Um, how do you deal with what's going on generally? Well, I think we need to focus on what you can, what you control. I mean, one of the things you control is sort of how, what you offer your customers and how you treat them and how you offer the service. Some of the things you can control, like uh, tax policy, you just have to sort of wait and see and monitor the situation. And in this, in the, <clears throat> the way that Trump is talking about lowering our, our tax rate, so right. that would be good news in our ability to, to invest in our business. But focus on what you can focus on. So you mentioned tax policy, and that's one thing. Uh, Dodd-Frank, there's been a lot of talk. I mean, I, I, you know, all the, the numbers that the Trump administration has thrown out in terms of dialing back regulations in general, uh, and then specifically Dodd-Frank. I mean, are you modeling out life with Dodd-Frank and modeling out life without it? I mean, again, like, to me, that sort of, like, would freeze you a little bit. So Dodd, I mean, first of all, I, I don't really want to go back to pre-2008. That, that, was, that was a pretty tough era with the mortgages and so on. Thinking about that, Frank, where it's going to impact us is when we cross the $10 billion mark. That's when a number of Dodd-Frank provisions kick Because you get here. bigger. And how close are you? Well, we're a couple billion dollars away. So that is uh, a little organic growth and one acquisition really away uh, from crossing that line. And we're preparing right now. Uh, if he were to sort of repeal some of the elements of Dodd-Frank, that would take some work off our plate, and huh. that, that would be good. Well, that's fascinating. So, I mean, not to break a little news or what have you, but um, are you going to hold off on that? On, are you actively looking for that acquisition right now? And the second question to that is, are you a little more hesitant because you don't know exactly what it's going to look like in terms of the regulations? Oh, we've had a great track record of acquisitions over the last decade. And uh, we have one pending to close uh, uh, in May, uh, Egertown National Bank and Martha's Vineyard. I am always willing to talk to management teams if they raise their hand and say, hey, listen, I want to talk about partnering up. The $10 billion mark does not scare us. We're, we've been preparing for the last couple years, the last couple billion dollars, and we will be prepared when we go, go over with the, if Dodd-Frank stays as is. So you're, you're 
totally moving forward with that. Totally that was hard. And yes. in terms of what about in terms of um, in not in terms of acquisition, just your organic growth in terms of hiring and other elements, you you're not hesitating at all, right? That now. Has, it's, it's full speed ahead. Huh. Now, in terms of your size, what, what, what's also interesting is, do you have a presence in D.C.? Do you lobby? And how much feedback are you getting? You don't get the opportunity necessarily to get in front of the president or what have you, but how are you, you operating in that area? So a bank our size really doesn't have the resources to have a Washington office with a set of lobbyists. So we really do most of our work through the Massachusetts Bankers Association and the American Bankers Association. They, they're really fully resourced to handle those issues. Now, as an executive, not as a, a voter and as a private citizen, the current environment politically does or doesn't make you nervous? Uh, makes me a little nervous uh, with respect to sort of the uncertainty out there and really sort of the, the angst that it's causing in, in the country. I mean, that, when people are nervous, confidence starts to go down and uh, you worry about the overall growth. Uh, but I think I, I have a lot of confidence we're going to see this through. I, I think that, that uh, we're going to um, uh, see some policies put in place that are, that are pro-growth while still protecting the consumer and the businesses. So I'm, I'm overall optimistic. Okay, perfect segue, because I want to talk about the consumer a little bit. Uh, you get to see patterns, right? I mean, trends are really interesting when you mm -hmm. sit in your position. What are, and there's so much about the digital banking world and more flexibility outside of teller hours, and mm -hmm. obviously you have to offer a full portfolio of services now. Right now, specifically, what are customers demanding of you? So that's a, it's an interesting sort of uh, two, two sets of demands. First of all, it's more digital, more digital, more digital. Make my banking experience easier. Let me do my banking by my phone. And we are constantly looking for ways to upgrade our, uh, our mobile banking, our online banking, our tablet banking. We have a series of very cool features that our customers Are you have. now at the position where they can take a picture of the check and deposit it from the, all picture that stuff? Picture of the check. We can even tell you, you can take your debit card and say, I want to do gas stations, but not restaurants. Huh. Uh, to really protect the consumer for where their debit card's used. The other thing that's really important is that, believe it or not, in this high technological age, people really want relationships, too. They want to know they can call somebody, yep. they can go into a branch and say, hey, I have an issue, can I talk to you about it? Yeah, it's amazing to me because I think it's full circle in the uh, whole society because now when I get a handwritten letter in the mail, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my that's God, amazing. Right? That's amazing. I'm definitely and opening we that. we write handwritten thank you notes. And that's so that sort of SOP for your, for your yeah, branch manager? That's exactly over. right. Huh. And in terms of, you know, when it comes to security, because the digitization uh, has led to a lot of hacking issues, a lot of problems, and banking has to have probably outside the military, like the highest level of security. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, ex how expensive is that? Does that bite into your margins? And do you feel you're adequately equipped on that side? It is very expensive. We're adequately equipped, and we're always monitoring for the next thing the hackers are looking for. That stuff make you nervous? Because as a, as a company, you're different than the government because you can really pay for the best out there, whereas mm -hmm. the, some people think the government's behind the private sector. I mean, do you feel like, does that keep you up at night? You know, I wouldn't say it keeps me up at night or I'm nervous. I will say that I'm very acutely aware and have the best people working on it to make sure we're always one step ahead of the crooks. All right, so let's, let's talk about the company for a second. The Boston Globe named Rockland Trust the number one employer among large companies in the area. Um, first of all, congratulations. That actually, in an area that has so many businesses, it's a big honor. The question I have is, how do you differentiate how you treat your employees? Like, are there a couple of things you can tease out that tell people, you know, because there's obviously people who watch the show that are always looking, you know, career-wise. Like, what, what do you do differently? Yeah, well, you know, it's, that's a great question. And I can point to a number of tangible things we do. A great performance management system, rewards and recognition, training, employee research groups, et cetera. But the thing that I think really makes the biggest difference is that we have a very high quotient of care and respect in our company. The degree uh, to which my colleagues respect each other, respect their customer, and respect their communities is extraordinary. But every company talks about culture. Every company talks about having, like, how are you able to, because it's something that you demand of, like, the manager. How, how does that, because how do you succeed in, in getting that culture through? It is, it is a culture that's been in existence for a number of years, and my job is to role model it, and to talk about it, and to share stories of that culture in action. All right, Chris, and it I works. I appreciate it. Chris Odlevson, CEO of Rockland Trust. Interesting. Uh, the growth picture, we'll have to have you back after some of these regulations get adjusted, if they ever do, and see how it affects your business. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. Still to come on this.